Welcome to everyone who's joining this morning's Centre for Digital Transformation of Health seminar. I'm Kathleen Gray from the Centre. I'd like us to begin today by acknowledging and paying our respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which the university's campuses are situated and the lands on which we live and are working. Uh, in my case, the traditional custodians are the Jaja Ja Rong people of central Victoria. So if you would mind just taking a moment to reflect on the traditional owners and the traditional health practices that they have given us to learn from. Now, um, a little housekeeping before I introduce our speaker today. Please make sure that you're on mute um, while we listen to the presentation. It will be recorded and please make sure that um, you are piling up questions in the chat so that we have lots of interaction following the formal presentation. And remember us on your socials. Um, please tweet and um, there'll be a reminder of our socials in the chat room shortly for you all. So without further ado, can I interest, introduce Dr. Subang Ko? And Dr. Ko is the director and co-founder of PMO Innovations and the vice president of Digital Health Malaysia. He describes himself as a curious techie who loves to solve problems. He has approximately 30 years of industry experience in Fortune 500 multinational corporations based in Malaysia and elsewhere. And he holds a PhD in electrical and electronics engineering from the University of Warwick in the UK and is active on the IEEE and a number of other professional and industry bodies. And we're delighted to have him here today to give us some insights into digital healthcare and the ecosystem that it operates in, in, in one of our Asia Pacific neighbors, particularly with the view to exploring what the potentials might be for us to collaborate further. So thanks very much, Subang. Really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say today. Well, thank you, uh, Professor. Kathleen for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Right, I'm very honored and humbled with the opportunity to share my experience with the talk entitled Towards Personalized Patient-Centric patient Digital Healthcare, The Malaysian Experience. Before I begin, uh, please note that I'll be sharing uh, this presentation subjected to the following disclaimer. Right, with that, uh, out of the way, uh, shall I start now? Let's take a look at today's agenda. There'll be only three things I'll be sharing. Where, one is where we are now. Secondly, where are we heading? What, what are the infrastructure that's available? And how do we get there? So that's all I have for this particular talk and presentation. So if you have any question, feel free to post it on the chat window. I will actually answer them uh, towards the end. So let's begin with the aspiration, opportunities, and needs. Why are we doing what we are doing, the purpose? So for me, you know, since I spent a lot of time in innovation, uh, I view the digital healthcare from the perspective of innovation lens, starting with the aspiration and purpose of working towards the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, in the area of good health and well-being, which is SDG 3. SDG 4 is quality education and innovation, which is SDG 9. So, Coincidentally, I think Malaysia also subscribed to this particular uh, 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Therefore, we are aligned in this particular department. With that aspiration aligned, and this is where I'm actually looking from the perspective of population health management, there is always an opportunity for us to use technology. For the sake of discussion, please allow me to walk through with you on this. Unless it's a congenital condition, every person has two possible routes living from cradle to grave, right? Those who lead the green route definitely have quality of life, stay healthy, and continue to contribute to the national growth. Well, sometimes, you know, if one were to be 
living the unhealthy lifestyle, aka the rate route, then uh, the person may end up with some illness or medical conditions at some point in life. From the population health management perspective, the rate route will incur higher costs to manage and run. To illustrate the point, let's take the cardiovascular disease as an example. Firstly, prevention is always better than cure, right? So if we are able to do that, then that is the best. We eat healthily, <clears throat> we exercise regularly, uh, we have a healthy diet, rest well, sleep well, etc. However, it's always easier said than done, right? If we fail to prevent it, that is where a person will experience some kind of complication or, or the onset of medical condition. So if you can't prevent it, then suddenly the rate route will come in. If you leave the rate route, since we use this cardiovascular as an example, and this is where you know, the potentially you know, we may have, the person may encounter a, a, encounter a narrow or blocked artery condition. So when you do diagnosis, def definitely you, know, you can use like angio angiogram, right? And or MRI, right? Just to do that. It costs money to run that, right? So after that, you know, when you ascertain, uh, once you diagnose it's with a medical condition, then you do intervention. The intervention can be in the form of like angioplasty, ballooning plus 10 or PCI, or even heart bypass surgery. Again, that costs time, money, and also maybe a little bit uncomfortable from comfortable to the patient. Uh, and guess what? You, the person may have to be medicated for life or, or because they are blood thinner and so on and so forth to keep the, man, the management of the medical condition under check. So this is a healthy route. So in short, if you look at this line, right, from the population health perspective, there's always a possibility of using the digital technology in the prevention, diagnosis, and follow-up care. Because we know uh, we medical professionals and clinicians has been relying on the technology to do treatment. So those, to me, is status quo. What we added on is more along the lines of it, the things that we can put around so that we can make the person's uh, journey, the, the patient's journey much more, better managed, you know, the outcomes are better, spend more time living and less time managing their medical condition. So in a nutshell, prevention is always better. That's where healthy living lifestyle is good. And uh, this is where everyone aspires to be. And from the population health cost perspective, I think there's a significant difference between the green route and the red route. But everyone, you know, uh, I hope you get the idea. So with that as a backdrop, where we are in Malaysia, right? In fact, Malaysia, uh, these are the top three communicable disease in Malaysia. And starting with diabetics, uh, we have actually 18.3% of us are diabetic, right? And there's also a lot of them are actually undiagnosed, right? So this is a confirmed one. So hypertension is 30% and high cholesterol is 83%, right? 38%, I beg your pardon, right? So when you look at this, right, high blood sugar, high uh, blood pressure, high cholesterol are ma major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And that's why I use that example. So with this in mind, I mean, uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, <laughs> when, when the disease comes, you know, it comes in the package of three, right? Diabetic, you know, hypertension, cholesterol. And this is a place where, you know, you don't want to be the 8.1% 8 8 actually is the one that's having a high risk. So to get an understanding of where the whole ecosystem is in Malaysia, because the healthcare cost always known is borne by the nation and uh, it actually has implication to how much we can do. So if we look closely, right, in Malaysian system, we actually have a pu public healthcare and a private healthcare. The public healthcare is uh, delivered by Ministry of Health Malaysia. So what it means actually, you know, uh, everyone can get healthcare for free, right? or a very minimal cost, like just five ringgit Malaysia, just to uh, see a doctor, right? So this is public. And then there's another section, which is a pie is about 49%. This is more along the lines of private healthcare. This is where private practice, practices will come in, right? So we look closely, there's a good mix between half and half. So in 2017, we actually spent about 57 billion uh, ringgit Malaysia which equates about you know, 18 billion uh, Aussie dollars, right, in healthcare expenditure. So when you look at this, 
the, the pie here, actually, if you look at this, just the public sector pie, and that's how much the breakdown we spend as a nation in terms of uh, the breakdown of services cu uh, of uh, curative care. And more importantly, I think uh, if you look at it, education and training, right? That's about 5% of it. So in, in a nutshell, uh, the source of this is actually coming from the national health accounts. And all the references are properly referenced so that you can actually go and dig, go, dig uh, a little bit deeper on those information I presented. So in a nutshell, public, private, so that 50-50%, and this is how uh, combining these two, right, we are actually providing all the needed healthcare for the population of 32 million plus people. Right? So our journey started actually on digital health a long time ago, actually, to be honest, 1997 to be more precise. So it all started with this telemedicine uh, blueprint. Well, you can trace back to 1997. It was an ambitious initiative during its time and possibly ahead of the technology and the infrastructure curve. There were no broadband during then, only 56K modem for you to uh, use to transfer a DICOM MRI file from one end to another, which fully tested your patients if you have patients to wait. Right? And the journey was rather bumpy as well and peppered with a multitude of complex factors and situations. Not surprisingly, 20 years later, we are still walking the journey. Nevertheless, the, the blueprint has laid down a great vision 2020 for us. I know that you can say that 2020 already passed. It was last year, right? So irregardless, whatever vision is laid down actually is very profound because it wants Malaysia to be a nation of healthy individuals, families, and communities through a health system that is equitable, affordable, efficient, technologically appropriate, environmentally appropriate, and consumer friendly with emphasis on quality, innovation, health promotion, and respect for human and community participation towards an enhanced quality of life. So with this, the focus of this particular grouping, by the way, you can actually Google this, you know, it's actually available uh, on the internet. The focus of the blue, this particular grouping is to shift the existing traditional healthcare approach towards uh, a, a, a system that focus on illness. You now you shift from the traditional system that focus on illness facilities and healthcare providers to the one that focuses on wellness of people, uh, getting capacity to deliver services directly to the people's home, right? So if you look like that, uh, people's home, which means that from day one, since 1997, there's intention to move the healthcare services back to people's home, right? So uh, with this as a backdrop, I now like to just you know, uh, put a frame towards digital health. Right? If you look at digital health, I think there's a lot of uh, loosely broad you know, uh, terminology that defines it. But in a nutshell, I think uh, I will just define it as this, right? Augmenting healthcare with the innovative use of modern technologies and digital services in empowering the person with data and insights for better care outcomes. So that is where you know, I, I will just define it as. So from here, you notice that we're actually you know, going to move towards empowering the person so this is where you know that this is traditional healthcare model, right? Which again, you know, it may not be sustainable because you no know, um, of the escalating healthcare costs. So the other model, which the telemedicine blueprint has already alluded to earlier as well, uh, is more along of empowering the person, right? Like me taking charge of my own health and well-being, but with the support from family and friends, and caregivers, community, and last but not least, clinicians as partners. So by doing that, you, know, uh, you are actually shifting the whole uh, responsibility back to the person. And we know that today, uh, it will go to see doctors, right? In the past, doctors prescribe a medicine to you, and then you just take, and then how many times per day you just follow that. Today, uh, most clinicians will tell you that the patient will come and tell you, hey, doctors, this, this drug is actually you know, having some side effect or, or you know, uh, we, we, together with the other drugs, if I were to take it, because you know, patients are more 
technology savvy, they're knowledgeable now, they have Dr. Google to do that. So uh, we have seen the disruption happen in the taxi industry where Uber disrupted the taxi industry. The Airbnb disrupted the hospitality industry. Today, I think uh, healthcare industry is ripe for the disruption. Uh, only thing is actually in all the disruption, right? The disruptor doesn't come from internal. Usually it comes from external, right? So this is where uh, together, if you go along the direction of that particular vision, where you can actually get your care you need, don't even have to be at home. It can be ubiquitous anywhere, right? It's like I'm talking now, I have these variables. It can actually tell where my medical condition is as well. So with variables, IoT, Internet of Medical Things, uh, point of care testing solution and smartphone will further enable the possibility of delivering the needed care directly to the person anytime, anywhere, and as well as personalized. Right? With that as a backdrop, uh, let me go back to here. Right? So now uh, I painted a, a background of where we were and then uh, what are the things that we have done so far. Right? So where are we heading? Right? So at this point in time, uh, again, you know, uh, looking through the lens of innovation, uh, we want to transform, right, in the sense that, you know, the whole traditional healthcare systems that providing care for patients to empowering patients to care for themselves with support from clinicians at home, right? So putting on the head of it, you know, innovation as well. I mean, I'm more realistic. It all started with a dream, right? We have this dream to have a better healthcare and services, well, to, in any innovation pursuit, right? But to realize the dreams, we need to check on the ground situation to ascertain if the digital healthcare is possible. Because we did that before in 1997, and I think we were ahead of the curve, right? Well, the good news now is that Malaysia's overall digital adoption is high, right? Here's a snapshot of where the country is. We, just, we are just a country of 32 million population, right? About 32, 33 million population. And our internet user actually is quite high. Mobile penetration, you can notice that it's 134%. It means that many of us has more than one uh, devices, right? So this is just to share with everyone in this particular forum that you know, uh, the adoption and infrastructure adoption is actually ready, right, this round. So uh, one of the telltale signs is actually you know, people do online banking now. So we know that you know, the trust from the user is very important. So if you can trust your money with the online services, the chances are you will be able to trust it for the healthcare as well, right? So with that as a backdrop, you know, all these references, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and until eight, they are all you know, references that <clears throat> you can look through online or you can contact me for information. Excuse me, the throat is getting dry. So with that as a backdrop that the ecosystem is ready, the next thing we look at it is actually why we suddenly want to move into digital health. Well. Uh, Malaysia's experience in electronics, semiconductor, life sciences technology, and STEM, STEM foundation fills the med tech industry ecosystem. Uh, this is the recent publication in uh, the Australian uh, newspaper where uh, Malaysian med tech you know, sector now comprises more than 200 over organizations, right? So there are products that come from, you know, ranges from heart valves, orthopedics, you know, hearing aids, and uh, ventilators as well. So there are some names that you may recognize, right? So they're all here operating in Malaysia. So with the Malaysian industry, because we are very good in semiconductor and electronics, today, you know, a lot of these digital components happen to have many of these electronics and semiconductor, right? With that as a backdrop, this is Malaysia. Now I'd like to introduce you to where we are, just to put the, the place in perspective. Malaysia is here, we are neighbor to Singapore and also very close to Australia. At this moment, uh, we are actually about 6,000 kilometers apart, right? So on the very northern tip of the peninsula Malaysia, that's actually a little island called Penang, right? So this is where I am now talking to you, right? So once you know the, the Penang, actually uh, we are home to electronics and semiconductor. It has been very vibrant since the 1970s. 
40 plus years of electronics and semiconductor experience. And you can see that uh, sometimes we are known if you are from tour for tourism, then it's Pearl of the Orient, right? Or even healthcare tourism, because Penang is actually very well known for uh, the healthcare tourism. And sometimes it started as Silicon Valley of the East with more than 300 uh, electronics semiconductor companies uh, operating here. Right? Many of them actually have designed the R&D centers. So you, have, you go walk inside any one of the multinational, it's the same as anywhere in the world. And you have thousand plus design engineer working in that, right? You can QR code, scan this QR code, you can have the full report of it, right? Another history of Penang is actually, we are home to uh, Royal Australian Air Force, right? You know, they only pulled out, I think, uh, about 1980s, right? I grew up, you know, listening to their radio station too, right? Last but not least, you know, Penang actually is a sister city of Adelaide, South Australia. Based on all these capabilities in electronics and semiconductor, there is no surprise that, you know, you can see that there's many medical technology companies, right? Such as Boston Scientific, B. Brown, Smith Nephew, Dexcom, the CGM, um, solution provider and so on operating up from here. So this, I'm not going to talk about it. This is what we are at this moment, right? So we have this infrastructure, which is very rich in terms of technology. The next thing actually we are talking about healthcare, right? So when it goes into healthcare, here's what it is. It is a highly regulated environment, right? So what it means actually, you know, uh, we have in Malaysia, if you want to practice as a medical doctor, you go to medical school, you come back, uh, you have to register yourself uh, with the medical uh, council, uh, MMC, right? Malaysian Medical Council is monitored by uh, Ministry of Health and all the medical devices has to go through a medical device authority. Drugs have to be regulated by many acts, which I'm going to allude to earlier, uh, later as well, right? I'll, I'll share with you in a short while. So there's another organization called MCMC. This will be similar to ECMA, I think ECMA in, in Australia. So this is an organization that regulates all the healthcare apps, digital health apps, you know, smartphone and so on. So it's very highly regulated. In the past, when we approached some of, still remember the private and the public healthcare, the private healthcare, you know, they don't really want to know about this because they want the patients to go back to the hospital the carpet and the chandeliers, right? It's like a five-star hotel. That's where the uh, private sectors of healthcare providers are. However, things change, right? Uh, you know, when they talk about digital, you know, COVID-19, you know, despite the impact and all the not so nice thing it brought about, it actually lifted barriers in terms of the barrier to entry in digital. It promotes the low touch and zero touch economy, right? So this is something that you know, uh, we actually are uh, Feel that it's a very welcoming sight because frankly speaking right in the past if you were to go and knocking at the doors of kpj sunway and so on they will tell you that no right so what was not possible before again you notice the press release you no know, ever since covid dawned on uh, earth us um, in march 2020 and suddenly you start to see you no know, private you know, facilitator or providers they actually starting to jump on the bandwagon of teleconsulting teleconsultation, telemedicine, and so on. The list goes on, right? So this is a good news. Once you have this, right, which means that the barrier is like, okay, we definitely need to go digital because that's the way forward. And it sort of speed up the whole process. I still remember UK NHS say that, you know, uh, 10 years of telemedicine arrive in just one week, right? So uh, if you go into this uh, private hospital website now, yeah, you can see that you can see you know, a schedule appointments and see the medical doctors online straight away, right? And the drugs and all those, you know, the medication will, will be coded to you. So here's one example. Ramsey Simdavi is actually you know, an Australian setup as well. And that's where uh, you know, they have presence in Malaysia, right? So with, with this, right, this is where you, know, you start to realize that uh, the barrier to entry to digital is no longer there thanks to COVID-19, right? Now, talking about that, because, you know, in uh, my synopsis, you have this internet of medical things. It started with internet of things, uh, big data, and AI. So here is where the ecosystem comes, right? In internet of medical things, uh, it all started with IoT, or internet of things. And this is where we start to see that 
you know, many of you may be wearing some kind of like smart watch, right? You know, Garmin, Fitbit, and so on, Apple Watch. So these are all the devices that collects the data, right? And then either use a smartphone or a dedicated gateway to get this information back into the cloud and then you know, uh, do some analytics. All right. So that's where you can start to realize that you know, even folks like Garmin, Apple, and all those, they don't own telcos. So they have to work with Telstra, they have to work with uh, Opus to get this solution to be deployed. And maybe they don't work on cloud, but Apple do. Right? You can see that no single organization is able to provide from you know, the whole stack of the Internet of Medical Things solution. And so that's the healthcare, right? This can be a CGM, the continuous glucose monitor. And again, right, when you look at this Internet of Medical Things and point of care testing solution, it's all about uh, hyper connectivity, right? So, one interesting finding from Gartner is actually if you look at the whole schema, grand schema of things, the analytics side, which is actually, you know, this is where the potential application of AI, the big data analytics comes in. It, gives you the whole like almost 80 percent of the revenue is generated from here and not the rest so you no know, apple may be selling you the iwatch uh, as a physical device but that is not a lot right in comparison to what you can do with the data that's one reason why people say data is a new field of the 21st century so let's take a look at this right uh, this can be a CGM or it can be even a simple thing. This is an organization by the name MC10, right? That's actually a printable flexible electronics that you can use to collect you know, data, the health vital sign. Like staying true to the big data world. Uh, in the past, we tend to get just the healthcare vital signs, right? The, the parameters. But with big data, you know, one of it is actually a variety, right? So this is where, you know, if I were to in uh, Kuala Lumpur, right? So I can do my you know, glucose check. Well, you know, it's in check. But the more I go into Melbourne, then I do the same thing. But this time is different because it has a location information, geolocation, the weather information. And if my diabetic condition went out of control, then I know that there's other elements that's interplay, right? So this is how things are. And it gives you more enriched data set. And therefore, uh, most of the time also that we say that, okay, you no, know, we will have doctors taking care of you or looking at the data 24 by 7, right? I think the answer is no. You know, the answer is actually we use the computer algorithm or AI assistance to do that. So in a nutshell, Internet of Things solution, which is going to get more and more, right? Uh, you know, from vacuum cleaner robots to your, your smart watches, you know, your glucometer, your blood pressure machines, they're all connected to the Internet, right? So when they connected to the internet, they push into the cloud and you have big data analytics. And then if you are, the data is too much, the data set is too rich, and then it's very difficult to comprehend by human being. Therefore, you explore AI, the deep learning, and uh, yeah, the deep machine learning and deep learning. So all of this actually sitting on the cybersecurity and cloud, it has to be secure. So that's why you know, no one thing can stand on its own. It's a mashup of the uh, government, uh, accumulation or aggregation of all the technology in the play, right? That is where the fourth industrial revolution is born. So I know that uh, I spoke to Wendy as well, because this is what I did in the past when I worked for a government organization where we get the like-minded people. So you can see that we can get uh, Cisco, Dell, Contron, IBM, Intel, and the University Science of Malaysia. We put up the uh, IOD cloud data center, right? For people to experiment with telehealth, you know, uh, come out with the point of care testing solution and so on. So you do a uh, renewable viable products, you know, uh, that kind of solution testing and for researchers as well to really get their ideas and translate it. Right? So at the same time, I also work with many startup companies and this is where, you know, you can see that it's no longer the traditional player. It's not the Cerner guy, it's not the GE, but it's a lot of people like, who would know that Dell actually comes into the place, right? Uh, in the picture and Contron and so on. But here is where the thing is. Remember what I said earlier? Disruption, you know, seldom comes from within the industry. It comes from the sidewinder or the people from the outside, right? Who sees the opportunity. One of it is actually, you know, uh, this again is a public domain. You can you know, scan the QR code for this. Actually, we, you know, we have uh, AI-enabled stethoscope, right? 
So it go through the full nine yards. It even have a, this again, like the clinical uh, study information, right? So again, you know, you can see the poster. It actually have a better, uh, well, in terms of the, how to say that? I have to say this very carefully because you now the traditional stethoscope, right? You know, that the doctors use to hang on the neck, right? That is what they're used to. But this is actually a new stethoscope that is uh, IoT enabled, AI enabled, right? But the thing is actually, you know, even though it goes through the full nine years of getting the FDA approval, this actually FDA approved, right? And uh, go through the clinical trial and everything else, which is much more superior than the existing traditional uh, stethoscope. There's still another layer that they have to cross because doctors like to hang their stethoscope on their neck. But if there has nothing to hang, uh, this is where the behavioral aspect comes about, right? So this is something that you know, uh, if you want to co-create things with your uh, ecosystem partners, be, do watch that in mind, right? Because the whole healthcare, the pathways from research to commercialization for digital health solutions, they are very long that, and bumpy as well, right? So typically we can go from awareness from, hey, I'm interested to go and do research and then co-create with some you know, uh, like-minded partners and translate the ideas into pro concept and they'll get clinical trials done, right? We get it tested with all the you know, uh, standards, CE, right? uh, FDA and so on and so forth and then um, introduce it into the market, right? So the space is actually, the way I look at it is actually a funnel, right? So it takes about 3,000 ideas to get a winning one, right? So this where in Malaysian context, actually we have this, the Ministry of Health, the MCMC, they're actually doing a lot of awareness campaign. Good job to them, MDAC, you know, a Digital Malaysia. These are you know, people who are actually continue to promote the digital lifestyle on how digital health can help them, especially in the wellness side, right? Wellness. Right? So then if you want to do research, that's where Crest comes in and then uh, do a proof concept. And this is where again, you got, you know, regulatory sandbox spearheaded by uh, spiritual rise. And then you also have a living labs, you know, accelerators, quite many, Sunway, you know, iLabs, uh, AdCat in Penang, right? Hong Leong Exchange and so on, right? Quite many of these co-working space. I think this is similar to uh, Melbourne Connect, right? In, in Melbourne, right? So uh, then you have this clinical trial. And this is where things get very interesting because this is where you need to get uh, your medical solution or digital health solution to be accredited by medical devices authority. This is where the regulators will come in and coming hard at you, right? You can do clinical trials, solution trials, and so on. And once you survive this, right? Just like the previous example of the status code, you survive this, right? You still have another, have another layer, which is again, go to market. How is the market acceptance? If doctors like to hang the status code, right? You need to find doctors who doesn't like to hang their status scope. Right? Uh, uh, well, to proceed with. So uh, again, you know, in, this is a place whereby if you start off with the purpose of you want to make a difference to a patient's life, then you, know, you are really, really need to go and all the way until the end to uh, bring an impact to the user. Otherwise, somewhere around here is actually a valley of death for a lot of uh, digital healthcare innovation. Right? So again, you know, uh, the industry is smart. Right, because it's highly regulated, and that's where the digital health uh, care services landscape. These are all the startups. Now you don't see a very established, you know, brick and mortar hospital in this type of space. Right? Remember what I say: disruptor usually comes from external, right? But now they're catching playing and catching up games. You can see that. Hey, now I know I'm actually coming online. Uh, I'm now uh, now offering you a teleconsultation and all those because in the past they dare not venture. So these are the things that you know. For innovators, they're actually working in the path of less resistance, right? In the regulatory. It doesn't mean we don't have regulation. We have regulation. And that's why they can only go along the lines of, you look at most of them, they are all more on booking appointment services, you know, uh, finding the doctors, getting a second opinion, right? And do teleconsultation via video chat and all those. This is happening thanks to COVID-19 because this is now is possible, right? So this again, you no. Know, uh, the startup landscape, right? With that as a backdrop now, I hope that everyone has seen where the journey has been, right? We are, we, how do we do it, right? So how do we get there? So one of the things that we realized that there is no platform 
for people to go. Right? If you're interested as a researcher, you know, uh, business people or entrepreneurs want to explore the digital healthcare space, there is no avenue. And that's where the Digital Health Malaysia was formed. It was formed to promote awareness and knowledge dissemination. It's, it was formed to facilitate telemedicine or digital health innovation. Excuse me. So advice on policy and legislation and also support the and complement national healthcare transformation and uh, provide uh, deliver develop digital health services ecosystems throughout uh, through a collaborative partnership approach. Last but not least is like enhance the uh, rakyat means the, the citizens trust and confidence in digital health services. So that's what it aspire to be. So with that in mind, because we know that there are two regulators, the Ministry of Health, which is actually here, right, MOH, and the MCMC, because this governs the whole ecosystem of digital health, right? So we have to get these two to talk. And it's not easy to get the high level uh, people to come together, but we eventually managed to get them. And uh, they are actually, these are the co-chairs now, right? On the telemedicine development group. And that's why you know, this was formed as TDG before it goes into Digital Health Malaysia. What's the difference? Because TDG now actually uh, is more like, you can notice that's actually a, a well, governmental structure and uh, Malaysia has gone through a few of changing hands of government. So that slows down a bit, but we now move the Digital Health Malaysia as an association to move forward with the exercise, right? So this is where the Digital Health Malaysia will come in as a, a non-profit association. And we have these four key strategic trusts that we move forward with, right? R ranging from driving policy, grow the R&D and innovation, go to market and develop human capital. That's where transformation and upskilling of medical professionals with digital is important. Frankly speaking, medical school never teach you digital. And that, that's a, the thing that we were like, we were like, oh, they never teach you. And then, you know, they ask you, expect you to perform on the job. So this is something that, you know, uh, is quite important. So long and, I mean, uh, before I finish, right, I'd like to, you know, summarize a bit of these challenges in healthcare. First and foremost, you know, the regulation is a lot. If you are a medical uh, or professional or clinicians, you are actually subjected to all these regulations. And uh, you can understand why you know, the existing clinicians, they don't really want to risk right, their license right, uh, by venturing into something that may right, uh, lead to the suspension of their practice. Right? So that is why you know, uh, medical personnel have to compliance to all the acts. The second one is actually the medical device compliance. This again, your device, medical device, software as a medical device or hardware as a medical device. But I think uh, this is a start good. But today, the ecosystem no longer buy the device. An example, right? If you, uh, your medical device, the glucometer, your blood pressure machines, it can be you know, approved. But the thing is that patients go for what? Solution. I go for a solution that allows me to have a better the diabetic management, right? Which need to use glucometer, weighing scale, right? Blood pressure machines, which is certified, but no one certified the whole apps, the grand schema of the solution. That is where the gap is at this point in time. So clinical studies and you know, clinical trials is important because you know, if you want to run, uh, like these are all the homegrown developed solutions. And because if you don't have the end in mind that you need to run clinical trials, clinical trials can be very costly. Typically in Malaysia, about a few millions, right? To start off with. So if you don't have this as end in mind, then you may not factor in and therefore your solution go until halfway and then unfortunately falls into the crack of the valley of death, right? So another thing is actually you know, health practices and change management. Just like for example, you know, the example I use, uh, stethoscope. Right? If you like to hang the stethoscope, you, know, you always have the behavior, right? Doctors must always have white coat and then hang a stethoscope. Without a stethoscope, you cannot be recognized as a doctor when you walk around the hospital, right? But the good news is that patients generally adapting very well, right? So user loves it, but it's the providers actually is hindering the whole process. Last but not least, the, the pathways to introduce health innovation is not there. And what I mean by this is like, a lot of them, you remember, they are startup companies. So let's say, for example, they, they approach MOH procurement. MOH will say, the Ministry of Health will say, okay, how many customers have you served? 
can you show me you know uh, the track record and all this and have to have three codes and all those it just you don't have that because you no know, that solution is so cool uh, you're the, the only one and then you don't have customer because no one buys from you yet and this is where it goes into that uh, like, like a catch-22 situation and I, I've seen uh, UK NHS using the innovation tariff approach whereby if after the test bit is done then you no know, you have a way of Winning the tariff whereby you can sell, you earn yourself subject to the efficiency and efficacy of the solution, like a two year period for you to sell back to UK NHS. Therefore, there is a chance for new innovation to be introduced into the healthcare system. Other than that, you, you know, despite all the full nine years you have done, you've done the clinical trials, you have certification from CE, FDA, and so on and so forth, you still block at the door without even being able to introduce, right? So oh, talking about that, then that's where the ecosystem approach is very important. And that's the reason why in Malaysia, for example, we have 36 CRC, the clinical research sites at this moment, it's dedicated hospital site to do clinical trials, right? We have uh, like uh, piloting the national internet of things. Uh, there's many internets of, internets of medical things uh, being piloted, right? And also that like, this, this particular rural, rural outreach whereby uh, in the middle of a jungle or, or, or a rural area, you actually have an internet center that has at least 40 meg 45 megabit of uh, internet speed. There are 800 over then scattered around uh, the deep rural area where you can actually put a health kiosk straight away. You know, these people will enjoy the uh, digital health. Right? And obviously collaboration is key because we are not the expert uh, per se in everything. And that's where you know, we collaborate with other people. And as well as you know, uh, in this particular one, uh, Crest still continue to do the R&D and funding the R&D projects in uh, healthcare space, right? So with all these things, right? Uh, in a nutshell, why we can do that is because our healthcare system is actually quite uh, uh, well on par with the world standard. We have uh, 12 JCI accredited hospitals in Malaysia, it's more private. Then we have an end-to-end -end ecosystem from R&D in STEM all the way into uh, med tech, life sciences, and so on. But we still have gaps to close, like what I just shared with you in the challenges. Uh, this is interesting. Clinical research and trials, right? We actually the sample size for top three most populated countries in this region. The Chinese for China, the Indian for India, and the Malays for Indonesia. And we are willing to embark on digital. If you give a glucometer, the CGM, continuous uh, glucose monitoring device to the, a British patient, they'll ask you, what data are you collecting on me? You know, you know my location, you know how, a, a lot of things. But if you give it to a Malaysian patient, right, uh, a test sample, they'll say, hey, bro, look at what I have. You know, they go and show off to all their uh, friends, family, and it's actually a promoter, right? This is good, right? So the regulations in Malaysia, we are there. We actually have regulations, frankly speaking, don't get me wrong here, but the regulators are willing to listen and explore, right? Last but not least, because of this, right, we have been approached by many advanced countries to do uh, some innovation here related to healthcare because they cannot simply even take off their uh, digital health innovation back in their country. And that's where the potential application of reverse, uh, reverse in innovation, where you start up with uh, developing countries like us, then eventually, you know, uh, when you see this, uh, scaling the, the solution scale, then you can bring it back to that your own country again and hence the international collaboration is key right so this is where if you look at here this is actually uh, uk nhs and the uh, academy health science network where they have all this these are actually a lot of things are there already right so we have mayor from uh, bristol you know they come and visit this actually when i visit them then they come back and visit us again and you can recognize that there are many of these like uk uh, uh Jewelry, i think the uk nhs digital person right and many many things along the ecosystem like life sciences okay? and also education right at this moment is uh, Britain right and we are always happy to explore with you know, other countries too so in a nutshell you know if you look at here this is actually an area of concern we can run hackathons co-creation workshops and all those right it, it will not bring you to this and this is where you need to really you know uh, map out where you really want to go right so with this, I think uh, I always see that you no, know, there's a lot of toys that you know uh, you can see all weird, weird, wonderful uh, innovation solution, innovative solutions, but they are still innovative solutions. But by and large, I think we see that with this healthcare area, 
actually is able to expand. In fact, you know, uh, most of the time when you look at innovation, there's a process to it. Rather than waiting for serendipity to happen, right? You need to have a process. And I, I see that you, know, you already have like Melbourne Connect and many of those co-working spaces that I'm running. So you can actually do that. In fact, I will see that, you know, I foresee in the well, five to 10 years time uh, with ISO 56000, actually this is innovation management system, whereby a lot of those well-kept secrets, because I used to work as innovation champion and inventor mentor in multinational companies, where we actually have a solution, which is secret, right? That we know how to churn out, like we have established a factory of innovation, continue to churn out innovative solution. But today, ISO is putting, is sharing out this secret sauce. Now everyone can do the same thing. And we foresee that eventually uh, healthcare is going to have even more uh, innovative solutions that come up from there, right? So this is again, you know, the same three circle. And that's where we work on here as a problem solving sciences and uh, how you move into business is again, the intersection between this, this improved healthcare. And most of the time, you know, you, you notice uh, solutions like Apple, they're more aesthetically pleasing because they have the humanity, the human factors there. If you do design thinking, you're still from this, this region, but you need to get people with a different uh, training to come up. In closing, what's on the horizon, right? This actually, you, know, you can see from, you can guess where it is as well, right? So Malaysia continues to explore enabling technology to create values in health and wellness. We started the journey since 1997. We continue to move forward. So low touch and no touch focus is definitely uh, digital is the key enabler. Therefore, digital health actually is, uh, can only go one way, more adoption, right? Digital health innovation is actually at the interdisciplines melting pots. It is where collaboration is key. None of us actually have the solution, but if we put, you know, bring our expertise together, we have the total end-to-end -end solutions. And uh, last but not least, we need to innovate solutions that matter to the patient. Because you know, uh, if you look closely, there are more than three, I think 350,000 apps on health and wellness. How many of them makes a difference to the patient? I think you have the answer, right? With that, I thank you so much for your kind attention. And that is the end of my presentation. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Subang. That was wonderful. Uh, really terrific lot of ground that you've covered, very rich examples and very grounded. Um, I'd like us to spend uh, the last five minutes looking at the questions that have appeared in the chat. Um, the first two questions from Camille Short are asking about navigating that valley of death, how to progress beyond it, and in particular, how much investment is needed to get through to that breakthrough to that next stage of success. What's your experience with that? Well, frankly speaking, right, I actually spoke to uh, Anna Brown, B Brown, I think uh, the granddaughter actually is based in Penang, right? So <clears throat> sometimes you look at healthcare, you know, product can be very expensive and you think that, oh, why they're overselling you, uh, they're overcharging you. But we forgot that the investment all the way from the left, right, in your innovation funnel until the day you can actually sell your product successfully, that journey is long. And then uh, the investment is a lot, frankly speaking. It depends on which product you're selling as well. So on that particular question that you know, the person who asked me, uh, it depends on whether it's in vitro or no, uh, not in vitro. It depends on that. But in typical solution, right? Let's say it's a startup space in Malaysia. If you're talking about you know, a simple, clinical trial, it can cost you about three, four million ringgit right, easily just for clinical trial, right? And that's not even talking about the, the, the drugs that are like vaccine trials and all this, but I mean, the vaccine trials in the COVID-19 is a special case. You can, you never see this thing being done in such a breaknecking speed at a, such a lowest cost because everyone tried to chip in for humanity, right? So uh, in, in normal uh, digital health solution, right, that you want, Again, no, I cannot comment and put a number for you, but the answer is, you can imagine, how much does it cost for you to get a CE certification? Right, you will know how much it, you know, your, your device need. Then your, your device will need to go through a lot of those qualification certification and every one of them costs. And you need to factor in that. My conclusion to you, 
uh, to that question is work with someone who already went there or, or walked that journey. Good point. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now I have, we have another question from uh, Cecily Gilbert about to what extent patient groups or members of the public are driving these innovations and are there examples of co-design that you know of in the space? Yeah, I think the core design is definitely there because you know, uh, still remember this this particular particular one. Uh, I think I show you. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll just verbalize it, right? Because the core design is important. But the thing is actually, you know, that's one reason why I use the word, you know, a design solution that really matters to the end user, right? Because at the end of the day, what do you hope to get, right? Because Sorry, yeah, I, I was actually trying to show you this particular chart, right? If you look at here, this is actually the way the... Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you do the code design, actually, I use a specific example. If you like something, right? In, in fact, you know, we, I didn't even talk about IP intellectual property yet, right? If you talk about IP side, you know, uh, all these digital health solution actually already, someone already found a lot of patents in that space. It's very crowded space. So anything that you touch, if you're a startup, the moment you're successful, people will come after you for the IP, right? That, that's, all it, that's how, how it works. So you, you can see this from this perspective, co-creating, yes, it's great, right? It's actually because you haven't walked until the end of the journey yet. So you think that, you no, know, uh, it's a very nice, nice place to be. But the thing is actually, you no, know, if you want to create a solution uh, or a solution that matters to the patient, right? Uh, this is something that is very difficult to do at this point. Co-creation, this is something that you do, right? An example here, I actually have this smart fork, smart walking stick and smart bed. This comes from researchers, they think that IoT enabled solution works. But to the elderly gentleman who is actually the end user, Actually, it's a burden because every now and then you ping you to do the 10,000 steps or every time you, know, you need to eat healthily and so on and so forth, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, so this is where I you know if you look at this, actually there's a video to it and uh, I think we are running out of time, but I think I can share this video link with you. This is a think tank that they, they work on this. So, but the daughter, son, you know, the, these three gentlemen has three kids, right? Three, three children. They bought the IoT enabled uh, solution, the smart solution for the uh, father, but they thought that it's good. But the thing is, like to the end user, actually, it's a dry, dreadful nightmare because every now and then you ask them, "Oh, ten o'clock, you have to go to bed now, right? Uh, you have to eat healthily and all those." Is that what the patient wants, right? So co-creation can only bring you at certain point, but after that, you need to really observe because anthropologists put on the anthropologist's mind at uh, the head and work towards that. Because innovation is, again, you know, I, I tend to view it from the innovation side and that's how we innovate as a corporate. So you observe, right? So co-creation will bring you to a certain level, right? And it, unfortunately, most of the time that, you know, uh, if you want to innovate something, don't ask your customer, don't ask the user, right? If Henry Ford were to ask the user, what do they want? He will end up with faster horses, not car. <laughs> you need to be able to really, you know, um, go and predict what people want. Still remember the late Steve Jobs when he introduced iPhone? <laughs> he used this word, when Nokia and Motorola gives you more buttons, the QWERTY keypads on the small, small phone, Apple gives you one, right, removes all. So this is where it shows a leadership. And to be honest with you, you can use a co-creation workshop to do your sensing. And that is the first brilliant one, right? But you need to go beyond that because uh, no, nothing beats you know, the real testing out pilot for the user and then reiterate from there. It's an iteration process. It's no like, you no know, straight away, I have this form magic formula and go for it. Wonderful answer. And, and I think just some great insights into the, the idea that we should be careful what we wish for <laughs> from co-design. All right, we have time for one more question, I believe, and that's from Alison Lister about, and who's asking if, if you were to think of the most successful implementation that you know of within the Malaysian digital health 
context, what would you what would you nominate? At this moment, it's all along the lines because COVID nineteen, right? You know the, the ecosystem that I shared with you. Those mm -hmm. startup ecosystem actually delivers value because at the end of the day, to me, innovation is about people willing to pay for the value, see the perceived value, and then willing to and subscribe to that particular solution. Imagine if I you know I want to see a doctor now. I don't want to risk myself all the way to the hospital. I just go onto the apps and then straight away do this online uh, teleconsultation. That's, that's it. it. It does the, the job, right? So it has a value. It develop, deliver immediate impact rather than a pain, a very nice picture that you cannot even you know, have this solution until five or six years later, right? So the, the essentially it's those ecosystems that I shared with you earlier. Yep, great, all right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Ko, for, for such a wonderfully experience-based seminar, um, particularly relevant to some of the learning health system curriculum that we're developing. And I'm sure of opening up a number of opportunities for us to explore potential R&D collaborations. Uh, I'd like to... Um, express my appreciation on behalf of the center and everyone who's attended today and remind everyone that the recording of today's session will be available on our center's youtube channel shortly um, and may i just take the last few minutes to share the screen to promote our next seminar on the 2nd of september Oops. Wrong screen. This one. We are hosting Associate Professor Jenna Weems of the University of Michigan. And she's going to be speaking by pre recording on the topic of augmenting clinical decision making with artificial intelligence. And she'll be joining us via Zoom for a question and answer session. That's on Thursday, the 2nd of September at 10 a.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Daylight Time. So once again, thank you everyone for your attendance, your participation, some great questions. Thank you again, Dr. Cole, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye for Thank now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.